Hi folks, I'm Alan Watt and this is Cutting Through the Matrix. Afi standing in for John Stadmiller uh, tonight on the 16th of December 2011. And uh, you've heard me of course, I'm on at 8pm Eastern and I tend to try and chronicle this big system that we live in as we go through the big changes, the plan changes, because nothing is happening uh, on a daily basis. The plans aren't suddenly drawn up in Congress or across the world by themselves. The, everything takes sometimes years to plan out way in advance. We're living through a script, as I say, and I tend to try and chronicle the big players who set up this system. Uh, their agenda is all wide out uh, in the open, actually, for those who want to know about it. And we find even some of the stirrings coming out to, during World War II, when they were discussing a, post, uh, a post-World War II world, and they wanted to integrate this system into a, a world government at that time, right at the end of World War II, and even put maps out, out of, of this uh, new world with a, a new Israel there, in fact. He called it Hebrew land, stuff like that. So all, everything that happens, you must understand, is planned years and years ahead of the fallout that we see as things actually happen and we go through them. And that's what I try to do. We, we're really trained through propaganda from birth. We don't realize we're trained. Every generation is subtly altered from the one before it uh, through the educational system. And this was a technique that was born and tested out in the old Soviet Union as early as the 1920s, in fact, and the 30s, because Beria, who was the chief of the NKVD at that time, talked to the young communist meeting, the common term they called it, and he outlined the strategy of how this perfect system would work. He said it used to take 70 years to, to alter a society, a generation, basically, 70 years to alter their perceptions and what they believed in. It says now we have it perfected because they already had kindergarten there, of course, in, in the Soviet Union. It's a prime thing. End of the family unit, the state takes care of the children. And uh, they could indoctrinate the children. Every two th- or three years, they'd upgrade their indoctrination so that each child, literally, by the time they turned 30, they would be ready for the world that would exist when they turned 30. They would all have all the right attitudes, the belief systems, the liberalist ideas, etc., etc. So every few years, you could literally upgrade the society. And that has been done perfectly, perfectly across the world, and especially uh, so blatant in the United States of America. Education also is a a prerequisite to uh, ongoing propaganda. One of the the, the masters on propaganda, in fact, was Jacques Ellul, he called himself, and he was a philosopher in France. He went through the whole system of the need to get the correct education so that all subsequent propaganda would take upon the people. Now I hear the music coming back after these messages. Get ready for Real Talk Radio. You're listening to the National Intel Report. Hi folks, I'm Alan Watt and we're back filling in for John Stadmiller. And talking about propaganda because it's so important to understand that pretty well everything out there is propaganda. It's a perfected science, perfected long, long ago. And as I say, you must go back to uh, the earlier times to understand what's happening today and why it's happening. Because even during World War II, those high up in the State Department were determined in the U.S. to bring in a world government. And they really, really tried very, very hard. They thought the public would be on their knees after so many years of war and high taxation and rationing in many countries. And they found out that the people were not quite ready, so they they went the long road, basically, the the long road to the same ending. But what they also did, uh, and you'll find out even when when, uh, World War II ended, they brought over people from Europe. And one was part of the Venice School, they called it, and the Frankfurt School as well. And these two groups were basically communistic. Uh, I'm putting it very lightly there. There's much more to it than that. But they were preoccupied with uh, world, the world governments and how to rule over people in authoritarian expert type fashion rather than this democracy that was too messy and cumbersome. So uh, the, the President of the United States actually uh, authorized the setting up of the combination of these two groups who ran out of Europe when Hitler came in and he set them up. They worked through World War II 
and then they called themselves the Macy Group. The Macy Group also brought in professors from all over uh, the world, including Lord Bertrand Russell, and their job was to so incredibly alter and radically alter the American culture and basically follow uh, the Marxist doctrine, end of the family unit, end of uh, Christian religion especially, and uh, and also the, the liberalization of all social uh, norms, as they called it at the time. And the reason they gave for it too was to uh, was that U.S. They said the U.S. was so like Nazi Germany, a fascist in other words, that it could become truly fascist. And that's what they hoped to prevent. So they wanted to bring in a world government, a liberal type system, but also ruled by the opposite of fascism, which is communism. It's just as totalitarianism or totalitarian. And I believe basically they're one and the same thing. They're two, two sides of the same coin. And they have the same kind of people in there with the same ideas. In other words, they don't believe that people can manage themselves and uh, they must be managed. As I say, democracy, they said, was just too cumbersome, too expensive, and uh, they couldn't get uh, things done quickly and swiftly because people had thought they had rights, and they would stand up and demand that those rights be uh, followed, basically. So we know, for instance, that one of the big groups that worked with Macy's, of course, was the Council on Foreign Relations, another totalitarian group uh, that was set up Really, it came out of the 1800s with the Cecil Rhodes Foundation. And the Cecil Rhodes Foundation, it was in league with, with Lord um, Rothschild at the time. Their job was to send guys across the world, start wars like the Boer War. And this is no conspiracy theory. This was admitted in the book uh, Tragedy and Hope and the Anglo-American Establishment by Professor Carl Quigley, who was a professor, the official historian. Uh, also for the Council on Foreign Relations. They started the Boer War and they blamed the Boers for it, much like we've seen happening time and time again uh, with the starts of war. The same techniques are always used, and then you start it and you blame the enemy. So you, you find that the Council on Foreign Relations came out of this group, uh, the Cecil Rhodes Foundation, but amalgamated with the Milner Society. The Milner Society was set up by a bunch of international moneylenders, uh, that's, that's the real big boys, the guys who lend to nations and buy all their bonds as well. And uh, they formed the Royal Institute of International Affairs. In other words, they had a royal charter uh, by the king uh, to, to do what they were doing. So the king obviously was on board for this, this world system. And the American branch is the Council on Foreign Relations. Almost every, uh, fight all major media personalities are members of this organization. You can't join it because you want to join it. You must be asked to join it. And you're carefully screened and watched for years before they'll approach you. But again, it's, it's good too if you go to the right uh, Ivy League universities because they do have their scouts there and, and residents that pick them out and groom them for their positions. A few nights ago on my own Broadcast. I put up a list of the so-called experts list of the Council on Foreign Relations. I might, I'll put it up again tonight on my own website, cuttingthroughmedics.com. And you can see this international group. They have, they have departments in every country across the globe. Now, they also, this Royal Institute of International Affairs dash CFR was not only to control all media and all propaganda and, by the way, entertainment, but also to, to go out, send guys out uh, and through corporations, they would build up corporations and monopolize different markets. They would go out across the world and they would uh, take over all of the world's resources. This was the world they talked about even before World War II, during World War II, and after World War II. And they've been awfully successful at that too, because as you've noticed, your water supplies are getting owned by fewer and fewer corporations. Personally, I think it's just one corporation, and we're given the appearance of competition. I really do believe that. The same with the agri-food business. Five agri-food companies own the, basically the food supply of the world and all the seed as well. So uh, I would say their agenda has worked awfully, awfully well. As far as the cultural takedown, uh, they've been very successful at that because they used everyone's tax money for years to liberate the female. That was important to unleash Eve, as they called it at the time, in their own writings, 
because Eve would go the same way as Eve would always go. It's worship me, and uh, I'll do what I want, and uh, I'll have fun instead of having a family. That was so important to destroy the family unit. So the pill came out just in, along with uh, the 60s, the swinging 60s. And that was promoted from the top down. All of it, the drugs, everything, came from the top down. All the top radio hosts and television hosts had uh, rock stars on falling off their chairs. And it was all tee-hee, isn't this fun? Including Britain as well, as America. And in other words, this was the culture they were promoting from the top down. Now, why would those who were in charge of your country uh, want to have the, the population emulate what they were seeing there. Well, it's obvious they wanted you to emulate what you were seeing, and it took off like crazy. The big foundations, of course, which are the fronts for the distribution of money and the agenda and think tanks that run the non-governmental organization armies across the world, they also get in on the act too, and they help fund a lot of the big, the big festivals in the 60s and 70s as well to take down society. They wanted to depopulate the world as well. And of course, if people, no one's marrying anymore, no one's having children, uh, if you legitimize abortion, of course, and they've got contraception, uh, then that would naturally bring down the population of those countries that were using those methods. Old agenda, the communist, is identical, as I say, to the communist manifesto. Every plank in the communist manifesto has been accomplished, basically when you look through them. And what we have today is simply the turmoil at the ends of an age, basically. Because the big boys, too, they use professors who classify history in ages. And we're at the end of an age, an age of commercialization, of consumerism, and we're post-industrial as well. We're post-consumer. But they're also saying from the big think tanks at the top, like Club of Rome, were also post-democratic. Now, it was a much faster way to end democracy than let it peter out gradually and gradually as you're ruled by experts. And we've been ruled by experts, of course, on television stations, even the weather stations, for many, many, many years. That's how you're conditioned to accept expert opinion, regardless of the propaganda behind it. But, as I say, the best way to do it was to, of course, kick off uh, the new American century, that was the 21st century, which really started in 2001, with a world war. A world war that would be so vague, too, uh, that they could expand the meaning forever, so they used terrorism, a war on terror. Because they wanted to reshape the whole globe and bring in this new system that's been on the go for an awful long time, actually, uh, now that society is ready to be mastered. You understand when society has been conquered You have all the problems that you've grown up with. You've watched it. You've read about all the problems. The mass welfare state was promoted, of course, because they needed women to be the ones who would want children to bring up children by themselves. So the welfare state was really created for that reason. So much so that in Britain and most European countries in the 70s, early 70s, they said that their massive building projects would be to build single parent family units. And they went ahead and did it. They they knew exactly where it was all going because there's only one way it could go. It's being pushed that way. And as I say, now today we're at the end of that because even the matriarchal system has been taken down as well as they dismantle the welfare state. Now everyone is helpless, you understand. No one, no one can get on with anyone else for very much of a time period at all. And when you, when you are like that, the government is big brother. And the big brother, brother can talk directly down to you. One of the big propagandists for this world regime in the early 1900s and late 1800s was H.G. Wells, who was picked up at school and uh, basically groomed for his position as a propagandist for this secretive group that called itself Milner, Rhodes, and then Rhodes of International Affairs. And I'll talk about what he said when I come back from this break. Hi folks, I am Alan Watt, back standing in for John Stadmiller, talking about uh, some of the history behind this so-called New World Order. It's very, very old, talked about copiously in the 1800s and even the 1700s. Interesting, going back to the founding fathers, and you find Franklin 
when he was asked about how this formation of uh, uh, federated states would come to pass, what hope did, would they have for the world? He said, uh, we hope it would be the foundation for a federation of the world. That's what they hoped back then. So there were so there was still a separate group working alongside the rest of them even back then. It's never gone away. It's still here, alive and very, very, very well indeed because it's on the march and it's, it's at the top of the tree. But going back to H.G. Wells, H.G. Wells talked about a, 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 um, a modern utopia. That was one of his books. And the utopia was one where they drastically reduced the population by sterilizing what they called the unfit and the ones who had, didn't really match up, including people who were dissidents. So it wasn't an IQ matter at all. You could be a dissident, you see. You didn't like the totalitarian uh, system where everything was so regulated. And they would basically to sterilize you and allow you to die off. And he thought that was much more humane than, uh, than, than just killing you, outrightly the communists did. But he also belonged to the Fabian Society, which had a, a desk basically right next to, to Lenin and Stalin, and they got all the information coming going for many, many years into the U.S. and Britain, right from the desk of the Kremlin. So the Cold War was a bit of a farce as far as I'm concerned, uh, even Lenin himself said that um, uh, first they would unify most of Europe and standardize the system in Europe uh, for about a generation, within 70 odd years or so. He says then the dictatorship would come down and communism would blend with into the West. It would move into the West. It already had moved, of course, during that whole period. And uh, it would be called something else. It wouldn't be quite capitalist and not quite communist. Well, this is what it's in today. It's globalism. It's an economic system run by top bankers. And, uh, uh, of course, the, the World Trade Organization that really is there to ensure that their own big favorite corporations can have free trade and everybody else is kept out of the deal. But they can also cut out any country from trading with anyone else uh, if you don't join. They use blackmail. So we're living in a planned society, a planned world, but you have to go back again to propaganda. Propaganda is so incredibly important as you're trained generation to generation uh, multiple times. Um, reading the polls even is very interesting because I can remember a few years ago when they came out with the big, the big uh, something was bound to grab the headlines. Uh, do you believe that, that gay marriage should be uh, legalized? And the, it showed you the people that, who were 50 and over said no, most of them. And then it got down to about the 40 age group and it was starting to wither a bit and uh, they did a bigger uh, percentage all for it. So what sort of thing? Once they hit the, the population at 25, uh, with, the, with the latest indoctrination from school, they call it sexual education, but it's actually indoctrination, uh, then most of them says, well, so what? Because they've been taught that nothing's right, nothing's wrong. And uh, so that's how we're trained. So when you have ideas and thoughts about things, you have to really first start with yourself and say, who am I? Uh, how did I become me? Uh, what do I believe in? How did, how did I get these thoughts? And, and retrace all your, your, your thinking patterns and belief systems and come to your own conclusions to realize that this has been an incredible war that you've been living through all the time. And it's never been openly declared upon you personally, um, at least not at your level or the media level, but it has been way above uh, that level. Everyone has had a war uh, waged upon them without even knowing, without even knowing. And as I say, when you read the old books, you'll find out, as I say, the great statements by Lenin and others who talked about this system merging uh, about 70 years later or so, and bingo on cue. The, the Soviets just give up, eh? Just like that. Yeah. Now, Jack C. Ilal, as I mentioned, who was a philosopher uh, in France, uh, knew this whole agenda, of course. He was a bit blind in other parts of it. But he did say propaganda must also furnish an explanation for all happenings. And if you listen to the simplistic news you get, uh, you're being guided to come to the conclusion with every on every point. So it gives an explanation for all happenings, a key to understanding the whys and the reasons for economic and political developments. News loses its frightening character when it offers information for which the listener already has a ready explanation. You've been prompted and geared for having an explanation. You can fill in the blanks for them. 
you see, or for which he can easily find one. The great force of propaganda lies in giving modern man all-embracing simple explanations and massive doctrinal causes, without which he could not live with the news. Back with more after this. Hi, folks. I'm Alan Watt, standing in for John Stadmiller, talking about how we got to where we are. And nothing happened by chance. We're taught, of course, and we like to believe that generation by generation, it's our generation, you see. And we think somehow we're doing everything. And what a stupid idea that is when old men and old women living in Hollywood basically give you your culture updates for every generation. Very, very wealthy people who aren't scrimping around in rags by any means, as the youngsters are, pretending it's their generation. I shall laugh when the Who came out and it was talking about my generation. And that was the theme back then, too, to separate the generations. That was was very important, too, because the communists talked about it and um, they said that if we could separate the generation, make a gap, they called it generation gap, uh, then uh, history and values would not be passed and it actually called it contaminated values, would not be passed on from parent or grandparent down to the child or grandchild. And they were awfully successful with that as well. So, uh, once again, the entertainment industry, everything comes into making you believe who you are and, and the society you live in and your particular generation as well. And when you're young, of course, you're a bit arrogant. You don't know everything you think you do. And... Uh, and you want to believe that somehow you're on the cutting edge. You know, we're changing society. Like we are changing society. All you, all, all the big boys need is a, a mob, a big, big mob of people who believe that. And they use them to the fullest extent. So as I said too, Jack Salon said the same things. His modern propaganda reaches individuals enclosed in the mass and as participants in that mass. That goes for every generation, you see. Yet it also aims at the crowd as well. But not only is a body composed of individuals. Uh, What does this mean? First of all, that the individual never is considered an individual, but always in terms of what he has in common with others. That's your generation. We're all here for a cause, etc. Such as his motivations, his writings, or his myths. So you've got to have something in common with the crowd, you see. That means also those who are pull, pulling the strings on you know how to get you into your kind of crowd. Pro, anti, whatever it happens to be. And propaganda tends to make an individual live in a separate world. This is the, the, the beauty of real overwhelming propaganda. The beauty of the Western propaganda is it doesn't appear to come from the government. It appears to come from what you think, if you think at all about it. Most folk don't. They just expect the same newscasters to be on on the same stations. They don't really think where they come from. They're all private organizations. They're all council and foreign relations. They're all owned by media moguls to make sure that all news is concentrated and standardized. And as Brzezinski said back in his book uh, from the 70s, Between Two Ages, he says, eventually the public will come to expect the the media to do their reasoning for them. What a fantastic job they've done, eh? What a fantastic job. You see, before all that, back in the 50s and 60s, people were very suspicious of the media. They knew uh, the characters, these media moguls who owned them. They knew they had political and social agendas. Not now. They've forgotten all about that now. So, as I say, propaganda tends to make the individual live in a separate world. He must not have outside points of reference. Every station you tune into has the same spiel and the same order, same stories. He must not be allowed a moment of meditation or reflection. Instead, a successful propagandist will occupy every moment of the individual's life. Are you being controlled every moment by an individual? To an individual, you? Through posters and loudspeakers when he's out walking, through radio and newspapers at home, through meetings and movies, because you see, the messages are always, they always come first before the events in the movies. If you ever wonder why that happens, that's intentional. It's called predictive programming. It implants in your mind of the possibility. When the real thing happens, it's kind of familiar and you go along with it. And that's from Jaxie Lull in the formation of men's attitudes. And also, it says, to make the organization of propaganda possible, the media must be concentrated, the number of news agencies reduced, 
the the press brought under single control and radio and film monopolies established. The effect will be greater if the various media are concentrated in the same hands. And that's from, again, the same book, The Formation of Men's Attitudes and Propaganda. So, it's it's been used on us to a fantastic extent. If you turn uh, just the moral side alone, which was the fabric, was the glue that kept society together, made it function, from, from, say, the 1930s, 40s, and 50s even, then the massive role it went on in the so-called liberation era. Now, most revolutions are actually social revolutions uh, under the guise of liberalism, and we've seen one after another until nothing works anymore. That was intentional. That's how you destroy a society. That's how you destroy an entire culture. And when they're destroyed, they're helpless because no one will stand up for anybody one time families would stand up against anybody at all, even government. But as H.G. Wells said, our aim is to so destabilize and eventually diminish any family ties that no one will stand up for anybody. And then Big Brother, the government, can, can talk right directly down to you. And when they come for you, no one's going to stand up and help you. That's the totalitarianism that H.G. Wells salivated over for his organization that he worked for. Incredibly effective. And the, one, one of the organizations he worked was the Fabian Society, George Bernard Shaw, uh, who again was elevated, because these guys are elevated up to be writers by the organizations that fund them and make them well known. And uh, Shaw said that eventually you, the people, will have to come to us and justify why we should allow you to stay alive. What are you doing for the great society, for the greater good, etc., etc.? So, here we are, the, the tail end of this part, as I say. It's a war for the whole global society. The Council on Foreign Relations is an amazing, has amazing websites. And if you enter them, you'll find that they're always way ahead of all the wars because they foment the wars because all, all their writers are members of the press and they make sure that they foment the wars. Uh, that's, their, that's their orders. And yet they're the, only the outer party of the CFR. There's an inner party as well. The European Parliament, uh, a, a special branch of the Royal Institute of International Affairs, or CFR, was set up for all parliamentarians there too, and for all their uh, bureaucrats that really run the show over there. It's not a democratic institution. And the one for Europe, as I say, the CFR for Europe, was set up basically by George Soros. So the money boys really run the show, but they always have for the last hundred odd years, rather blatantly and openly, if you really go into the history books. They know what their agenda is. Uh, They believe, as I say, in a world that's going to be vastly reduced in population. They believe it's time and evolution, you see, the really high evolutionists, to get rid of the unfit, uh, all the useless eaters for a post-industrial society, and also they want to and bringing a utopia for themselves to live in. You know, the proper people will have the utopia where the world, is, all, the, all the villages are just flattened and disappeared and they can go hunting uh, because they're already restocking uh, the land around you in the rural areas. They call it rewelding, but they're restocking them up with uh, wolves and all kinds of predators uh, as we still live in on the land. That's how much uh, contempt they have for the general public. Now, As I say, you can't really talk enough about culture because it all swings on culture. The U.S. of the 30s, 40s, and 50s still had, at least if nothing else, it had definitely a strong Christian culture. It doesn't matter if you were Christian or not, the culture was Christian. Uh, There was no such thing as moral relativity. Everyone knew the tribal rules, and that's what they are. They're taboos or tribal rules. Every little tribe has them. Very simple. You follow the rules and everything works. If you break the rules, because these rules are so catastrophic, even in a small tribe, you you get rid of the people. That's what they did. And we we find now that uh, promiscuity is at the top of the tree. Everyone's promiscuous because that's normal now. That's normal now. But they don't have children. They don't have children and then they bring in masses of immigrants and then everyone gets upset with the immigrants because they're the only ones having families. 
because they haven't been destroyed yet culturally, whereas the, the native people are. They've already been destroyed. It's here. It's done. It's finished. It's so debased now. When you watch music television or anything like that, it's just a, it's just a very scantily clad orgy you're watching. And that's called general entertainment. There's pornography everywhere. And uh, that's to ensure that no one's going to bond. That was the whole key. Uh, some of the top players in this whole movement many, many years ago said they must separate uh, the bonding that comes with sexual intimacy. They must separate it completely until there's no bonding takes place. And that's what comes out of promiscuity, you see. That way, no one starts a family as a family. No one stands up again for anyone else. Bertrand Russell, again, the big player with the Macy Group and the Frankfurt School and many other of departments of this world organization, uh, said the same thing. He says, we shall create a hedonistic and narcissistic society. It's all about me. Look at me. And uh, a perpetual Peter Pan's. People who would never want to grow up. And we go into any big city now and look around you. There's no wisdom from any elderly people. At all. They're still trying to dress and look uh, like the, again, music television um, performers, put it that way. It's rather sad. But they have nothing to pass on. All they do is watch television. All they talk about is what was on television. There's no wisdom. They don't read. They don't even communicate properly. They have nothing to say. As I say, Brzezinski knew this. So they have nothing to say uh, and communicate to each other, he said, except what was on the previous night's news. Or television. And that's all happened. These guys don't make these statements, you understand. When you read these books, they don't make such statements lightly. They, every word and every phrase is carefully, carefully thought out. Incredibly carefully thought out for those in the know. And that's why they have the writers go over it or readers go over it and over and over to make sure there's no superfluous wording. And that everything is precise and coherent for, to those in the know. And that, that these are the ones who generally read the books. Most folk don't care about them. They're not sexy enough. They're too boring for the young. And so you, you find deep, even people like Adorno, Theodore Adorno, who was brought over specifically to alter the culture along with the Macy Group by the President of the United States, by the way, post-World War II. Theodore Adorno uh, also talked about this technique in some of his books, and he was an incredible snob. He um, he said that I would like to write in my native German. He said it's more precise than English, which was true. But he said that the average person says I would have to change my style. He says most people cannot carry a thought any longer than about 15 words in a sentence. His sentences sometimes ran two pages. Now, even though he's a snob, he was also telling the truth. Most folk today think in bits and bytes of information. And before that, people used memory. You could follow a conversation. You could follow a thought or a sentence, even if it was two pages, without losing the initial thread of the start of the page. Most folk can't do it now. We've been so dumbed down, so dumbed down. Other techniques have been used in us as well. We know that the IQ has dropped. A few years ago, the UN readjusted the new IQ, the new normal, to a few points lower. We've all been poisoned with the drinking water additives. We've been poisoned with inoculations. And to cap it off, off we also have been poisoned by the GM food, which is also, also apart from the GM part of it too, it's also so sort of full. It's actually saturated in chemicals in every cell. It soaks it up. The plants soak the stuff up in every cell. And the cancer rate goes sky high. So once again, you achieve your, 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 your objectives. Sterilization, uh, cancers, death, depopulation. Stupid people. Stupid, but you must admit, there's never been a, a period in history where there have been so many stupid, happy people. Let's be honest. Let's be very honest about it. The, the, the culture that's been brought in again uh, in a roller coaster, apart from promiscuity, no families, just party, is the party itself. Many, many years ago, youngsters never thought of partying every weekend. Now it's into all age groups. That's what you do is, is you party. 
Then the guys sit there and, and watch sports with their pot bellies, pretending, projecting onto their, to the team leaders that they're in there on the game. What a joke. Because he's been emasculated for years. He's out the picture because they gave all the power and authority through indoctrination to the female. And the females, uh, if they they can easily dominate a male, they'll always hate the male. This is something that the ancients knew. A specific religion have always known this. And, uh, and they make good use of it. And also, um, that, uh, as I say, she'll be, if she can't dominate the guy, she'll, she'll hate him. She'll end up hating him. But she'll always test him. Even, even if she's on a par with a guy or respects a guy, she'll still test him forever. That's just nature. So uh, you understand when you study nature, you can see the Achilles heel and everything if you want to weaponize it. And that's what the big boys did. You can go as far back as, as Madame Blavatsky, who was put out there to bring in women into a, a mystical movement. Because religion is very important, as I say. And they wanted to start a religion off, a kind of female branch of Freemasonry back in the 1800s. And she was a fraud, caught many times. She's also a lesbian as well. Uh, she started up houses for homeless working women and then got in trouble with the women, actually, and kicked out. But anyway, I'll talk about that when I come back from this break and continue on my thoughts here. Hi, folks. I'm Alan Watt, standing in for John Stadmiller, and uh, I was going to talk about uh, Blavatsky there for a minute, but uh, she did say it made some amazing things about the future because she was in on the Masonic idea too, because Masons at that time were radical, they were revolutionary in fact, and that was well known. But uh, I've got callers hanging on the line here, there's Larry from Louisiana. Are you there, Larry? Yeah, uh, you, you mentioned religion. Who was that that said religion is the opiate of the people? Well, Marx said it, then Lenin said it, and many yeah. do you do you do you think that the, they had had a couple of huffs of the good stuff, so they knew what they were talking about? Uh, like, let's take them Taoist priests. Are they like a junkie down in the gutter, just crawling around, or is there a methodology in which one could use a thing like that and live a, a pretty much normal, successful, and productive life? You talk about using a religion successfully. Um, of course, even in ancient, actually in, in pagan times, in the ancient times, uh, compared to the, to the modern standards, pagans were more moralistic than we are today. Oh, okay. Well, I was just wondering because, you know, you know, the, the, the Taoists, they, they use opium as a part of their religion, but they're not just stone junkies uh, out in the corner, uh, gazy eyed in the. Yeah, I mean, you, you take, you take some sects of India, like the Jainists, and, and they use, uh, hashish in their ceremony, so they are stoned, absolutely. And even Blavatsky and Theosophy, they used to bring in, um, uh, bowls of burning hashish into the, into the halls. Everyone got stoned during the lectures, and that's why they became true believers. <laughs> but so, drugs have been used, and the ancient Greeks also used drugs as well for some of their high ceremonies, um, where they would actually go out to, it was a day where you went out and grabbed any woman and just simply raped her on the spot. Uh, but they took a lot of drugs before they did that. So uh, drugs have always been used, uh, actually, in a lot of, in a lot of religions, uh, still are in some of the present modern day religions as well. But, um, you'll find in those who, who run the world, who always had this alternate agenda, uh, they've always used drugs in, in their, their high uh, courts, the ceremonies and so on. Uh, they have their own particular, uh, belief system. Okay, well, thank you. I just wanted to get your ideas on that. Thank you, Alan. Okay. And there's Rodney from Illinois on the line, too. Hello? Hello, Alan. Yes? Yes, sir. Uh, Go ahead. I do enjoy your, I enjoy your shows in the evening. Um, I'm thankful for this opportunity to call in. Um, I've failed uh, to get through on a couple of occasions. I've got a friendly debate going on with a good friend of mine. And it centers around the concept of conspiracy. Mm -hmm. My friend says when he is confronted with a scenario where conspiracy or incompetence are the obvious choices, or let's let's say just two uh, choices at the top of the list, he prefers to err on the side of incompetence. Now, I myself um, choose to err on the side of conspiracy, as in malice of forethought, he chooses 
to err on the side of uh, incompetence with no thought. Mm -hmm. And this is a concept I've been wrestling with for 20 years. Yeah. Now, as, as you may guess, being a, um, um, a, a listener of your program and uh, what I've just said, where I come down on this, but there, there seems to be still a dilemma uh, trying to um, identify the motive, the, the intent, and just how widespread this filters down um, from on high. And I yeah. was wondering if you could address this sure. dilemma, this debate. I'll do that when I come back uh, from this, this break. Okay. Hi, folks. I'm back and uh, filling in for John Stadmuller. I was quite sure, actually, if that was a break coming up with uh, news or what there. But um, it's interesting, too, that the idea of uh, conspiracy theory uh, and the accidental view of history. Of course, the media always give you the accidental view of history. Uh, same with the bank crashes as an example. Remember, going back, remember what uh, Jack C. Law said about propaganda must be given in a simplistic manner to the public that they can jump on and believe. So it was just a few bad people you see that kicked off the whole the whole thing and uh, banks collapsed and uh, dominoes fell and et cetera, et cetera. And in reality, the new years before, they were going to bring down the banks because the whole stock market really is one big gigantic bubble anyway that's built on lies and enthusiasm. That's right, and greed, of course. It's always been that way. Years before that, years before that, uh, Greenspan came on at one time. It was, it was so amazing when Greenspan came on. Uh, it's, so, it's, it's a very unique American thing uh, where the heads uh, comes on and talks about the money system. And he said, the stock market is going too hot. Cool it. That's all he said. And everybody held their breath, and, and they did. It didn't happen this time because it took all the safety guards off. Back with more after this. Hi, folks. I'm Alan Watt, standing in for John Stadmiller tonight and just giving some background information on how we got to where we are. And I'm comparing the accidental view of history that the media would like you to believe in uh, with uh, the conspiracy view of history. And history is full of conspiracies, absolutely full of them. Look at any start before any world war starts. Just look at all the different goings on, who wanted wars, etc. Read Carl Quigley's book, uh, The Anglo-American Establishment, how they literally sent uh, mercenaries over. Uh, generally the sons actually from CFR members or they call it Royal Institute of International Affairs in Britain, same group though and uh, they attacked the Boers and they took with them a Times reporter and she telegraphed back that uh, the Boers had attacked the British and so the British brought the troops in to defend the people that's how they get war started all rigged, that was a conspiracy the history is full of conspiracies same time, too, when, when ancient uh, Roman emperors would, would, would get stabbed on the steps of the consul uh, by all, all the members of the Senate. Uh, they all had a chat about it. When we get the guy, should we kill him? Should we not? Who's going to do the first blow? These are conspiracies. Happens all the time. But the media, as I say, is meant to give you the accidental view that things, oh, oops, something went wrong or a bureaucrat slipped up here and, and uh, et, cetera, et cetera. We've seen it all our lives, actually. This is how they, because we're pretty stupid to them. They, they know that too. They know we like simplistic propaganda and we lap it up. And um, the problem is too with those who cannot go into the books and see for themselves, even if you, it doesn't matter how much evidence you show them, uh, for, even from official historians, it doesn't make any difference whatsoever. Uh, their indoctrination, their propaganda indoctrination has taken, just like an inoculation, they'll say, has it taken, does it work? on this person. Well, on these people, it's actually taken, and partially, partly they choose not to know. You understand, too, if they know what's really going on, you, they'll be very angry often, especially if they're a placid type who likes the sports and sitting back with the beer and all the rest of it, the routines, because when they know the truth, you've, you've handed them a decision to make, and they don't like that, a decision to get active and to be angry about things. Lots of folk like socialism. They like Big Brother. They like being taken care of by all these experts above them. That's what they believe they're being taken care of so that they can go and play. And here you are dropping in their lap uh, something that explodes their whole lifestyle, leaves them with a decision because what kind of person could they possibly be knowing all, all this now if they know it all 
and do nothing, you've upset their whole lifestyle. That's why they'll turn on you. And it's a shocking thing for a person who's completely propagandized to be told that your own government is not your government at all. It hasn't been for a hundred years. It's a big shock. All those movies have lapped up, watching people in the movies, actors getting little, little stars and the tears coming down as anthems play. That's all indoctrination. And suddenly you're upsetting the whole upper, they'll, they'll turn on you. Because they can't tell the difference between movies and fiction anymore. It's all part and parcel. It's all interwoven. The conspiracies have always existed. And therefore, I've told people, don't don't pick on someone who is completely propagandized and indoctrinated. Uh, they're perfectly indoctrinated. There's no point. You, you, it's an ego thing it comes down to. Uh, pick on someone who's asking, asking questions. And when they ask questions, don't overload them. Right off the bat, you'll sound crazy and you'll scare them. You only give them enough to chew over for a week or two and then feed them a little bit more. After all, here's a brand new reality you're presenting to them. All this time, no matter how how old they are, uh, they've been believing in another another completely other reality. And, uh, And it's a shock. It's a tremendous shock to them. Tremendous shock. And when you find out too, uh, that so-called democracy doesn't exist. You go through the grieving process, the anger process. You go all through all the same phases when you realize you've been fooled your whole life long. So much so that, that a lot of people will attack the one, the bringer of the news, the one who tells them, the bearer of bad news. They'll attack you. Some paranoid types get stuck on that and they'll attack you forever. It's like a fixation with them. So be very, very careful. But no, the media is there to present articles to you so simplistically, like no one knew. The stock market, as I say, about two years I read before the the big crashes started to come along, the bankers all knew at the top because they're all in on it, because the Fed said at the time uh, they would stop injecting cash into the stock market at the end of the day if the, the top 500, etc. were too low. They've been doing this for 25, 30 years. Every country's been doing this. So what was going to happen when they said, we're not going to ever do this again, you were guaranteed that all the big sharks, that they all knew were sharks, were going to be scrambling like crazy trying to cover all, not just their asses, but their assets, right? And uh, and panning off uh, uh, dummy mortgages and fake mortgages and, and, and overblown mortgages onto some other banks. I had to come home eventually to somebody, and that, that kicked off all, all the rackets. But banking is full of rackets. It's full of rackets. And as I say, we've been run by a particular, a very rich group for a long time. There's, there's only, at the very, very top, there's only about 80 families, you know, who slush around billions and billions every day across the world. And they direct countries are going to rise and countries are going to fall. And there's about 200 behind them who, who slush around maybe three quarters of what the top ones are slushing around. It's all rigged. But it was guaranteed to crash because it was time to crash it. And believe you me, any economist will tell you, since the whole thing is based upon optimism, that's the first uh, trick they're taught in economics, you never tell people bad news or they pull money out of the market. When, you, when they bring on the President of the United States, who says that this depression is going to be worse than the Great Depression, well, what do you think was going to happen? Why did they get the president to announce this to the public? To bring it all down. Time It's time to bring it all down. That's why. That's why. It was time. That's how things are planned, really planned to, to take down whole countries. It's planned just like that. And those who want to believe in the accidental view of history will never grasp that. They'd never do that to us. Why not? They've done it to every other country before. Why not you? You understand, those at the top are complete internationalists. They have no more liking for the peasant of China to the peasant of America or Britain or France or anywhere else. The only only thing they're interested in you is how much can you produce and make for them. That's all. That's the reality of life. That's the hard and harsh reality of life. That's how they see you. That's how they view you. I've talked to, and I've known them pretty well, actually, um, women who typed up for law companies, big law companies, big legal companies, including the Bush family and others, 
and she sent me a lot of information on how they really talk about the general population. They all do, just no matter what party they're, or side you think they're on. There are no parties or sides. And it's incredible how they talk about you all. That's what runs the world. Money and the legal system. Money runs the legal system. They put their own, often their own cousins or brothers into it. And they also can make anything legal, anything legal. They can confiscate anything from you anytime they want. They can do whatever they wish. That's the reality of a moneyed system that's run by private bankers. Obviously, the same private bankers have been the only ones who are allowed to use money for thousands of years become the top. They run countries. It's, nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. All wars are economic wars. And Mark said that. And that's true. Not all the propaganda they give you about why the start. They always give you simplistic answers. We all know. And even, in fact, on, I think it was on John Stadmuller's show back in the 90s that people on talking about the, the Pearl Harbor events with, with guys who were alive at the time who said, yeah, we all knew it was coming. We knew it was going to be Pearl Harbor. And they could understand why why FDR concentrated all the ships and brought them all into that spot. Well, they brought them in that spot to beat the big spectacle. That was the Twin Towers of that era. To make it happen, he'd already been had his, had his guys shooting down Japanese planes for over two years across the Pacific to get them all riled up. And now they bring books out years later. This is after the official Secret Act is up. This is how we get told the truth 50, 60 years later. Until then, they lie their faces off. And they bring experts on to lie and lie to every generation. And then they say, oh, actually, yeah, uh, we, we started that war ourselves. We were, we we're blocking the Japanese from getting any resources. And they live on importing resources. Yeah. All wars are the same. I won't even touch on the farce of the Twin Towers. It's such a farce. But people want to believe the media. You understand, too, there's also please, people pleasers. And the Delphi technique of indoctrination and swaying an audience. You've got to understand that they use the same technique they use on the general media. They bring in a so-called expert. They, they, they pump them up in the local media for a while. A uh, person coming in to get, to get the local population to accept this agreement for their watershed area, paying for water, paying for this, paying for that, the reasons for it. And you, you'll, you'll add ten different letters behind his name. He's something very important. Uh, it could be any actor, of, actually, who, who's been trained in the technique, it often is. And then they stack the audience with, with their own people. But they also use ones in the audience who sit down front. These are the people pleasers. They, these are the same guys who would bring the apples for the teacher. And when you complain about something or point out that there, there, something's wrong, those people stand up and criticize you. And the Delphi Technique character is very happy. Back with more after this break. Hi folks, I'm Alan Watt, again filling in for John Stadmore, just going over some of the stuff we must never forget, because every day, every day, we're overloaded with data, and we forget the past. If you forget the past, you won't know how you got here, and now you're reacting to today's propaganda. And most stuff comes from the mainstream media, who are telling us all, be very, very afraid, oh my goodness, be very upset, which makes you turn more to government to save you. That's how abusers um, uh, and abused people work together. The abused always turns to the abuser for help. These are old techniques that are used daily on you. So you mustn't ever forget how we got here and what's behind it and where it's supposed to go. Now, I talked about the, the Delphi technique. Just, just touched on it, how they stack the audience, but how they also use the completely indoctrinated, the people pleaser type, the one who likes professionals and experts. They watch television. They have their favorite characters that come on their news every night, stares them right in the face, and, and they'd never lie to you. That's what they like. They're told nice, safe stories. We're taking charge of this for you. We're experts. They like that. So when you stand up and we say, well, we know that you're part of the Maurice Strong's program, for instance, um, for, for, the, for the, the Earth Summit, and this is all part of Agenda 21, then these people, they're an army that stand up against you, the, the people pleasers, the, the perfectly indoctrinated. Oh, shush, let the man speak. Let the, guy, let the expert speak. Oh, you're crazy. Every manipulation under the sun can be used. And getting back to Blavatsky, she mentioned this technique in the 1800s. She said technique will shortly be used on the general population, which will formulate all their opinions and bring them to the right conclusions. 
she said, and they'll never know how it's even happening or that it's happening at all. And that was reiterated by Lord Bertrand Russell in the 1950s. It's perfect, perfect. And the greatest tool to get you used to that, this technique, is television, of course. It's been the best tool ever dreamed up. You're, even the ads indoctrinate you and alter your culture. Every comedy does too. Can't get away from it. So remember too, that this system has its agenda. It's a, a, a rule by expert society, a vastly reduced population. They've been awfully successful. Most so-called first world countries, their populations have been plummeting. And uh, regardless of what they say, even the United Nations admits through their census were plummeting. I've read the articles on my own broadcast, cutting through matrix.com, one after the other, where they admit that the people uh, are simply not having children and, and they depend upon immigrants to keep the population up. Even saying the reason they bring in so many immigrants is to pay off the debt. There's not enough left, an offspring left, or, or future offspring to pay off the national debts. So what are are we, economic units? Well, you're darn right, that's what we are. We're also units to to put on uniforms and go and slaughter people. And and youngsters really don't need much encouragement for that. They never have, to be honest. Let's be truly honest about the military. The military came out of mercenary groups that kings used and queens used a few centuries ago. They had no problem getting mercenaries because they got to rape and they got to to plunder and, uh, and and fill their bags with the plundered items. Today, it's much easier to just recruit from guys who've been brought up playing video games and watching movie after movie that's been paid for by the Pentagon. And the Pentagon works very, very intimately with the Hollywood producers. And they're often related, in fact. They know the agenda. They know what they want. And young guys want to dress up like the, the winners. They see them as winners, you see, these guys who win all the time. They don't want to be losers. And they want to be winners. They want to wear the outfits and have, carry big guns and, and blow people away and, and talk cool about blowing them away. That's what the military really is. They're not all fighting to protect anybody. It came out in the papers in Europe that Tony Blair was approached a year and a half before they invaded Iraq by all the top oil executives and they made deals that when Britain went in they would eventually divvy up the oil fields to all these top corporations. That's how war is run before it even happens. Same with Libya, same with everything else. And the gophers at the bottom uh, that like to slaughter, like to kill, want to come back and be big men before they get pot bellies and sit on their, the couch watching sports, are very willing to go off and do it all. And get drugged. They're on, on about seven medications each when they're over there. But they're not fighting for me. They're not fighting for you. They're fighting for those who've decided that they're going to survive into the next age, as they call it, uh, as we all perish. I mentioned, I think it was a night, that the towers went down, in fact, on radio, that you better get ready for everything that you see in warfare, right down to refugees eventually within your own country and rationing cards. And lo and behold, I went to the CFR's website a couple of years ago, and they've been working on the coming food famines worldwide for 16 years, just with one little think tank. The think tanks for everything. That's how we're managed. Back with more after this. Tuned in to the National Intel Report, the real talk radio show. Hi, folks. I'm Alan Watt, and I'm standing in for John Stadmuller. Just, it's good once in a while to go over how we get to, we've got to where we are, and why we got to where we are, and to reflect on the changes, the changes that have come up, come and gone. And most of them cultural changes because that's so important. You can't simply bring in totalitarianism without preparing the culture step by step by step towards accepting a totalitarian culture. As I say, there's no doubt at all that the people of the 1950s or even 60s would have stood for this op- the open 
totalitarian police type states that we have across the whole of so-called Western civilization. There's no way at all that anybody would have stood for that. They have to prepare in advance. You always, it's like a field. You, you come across a place you want to make a field. You get the trees out. You get prepared the soil. You got to till it and all the rest of it and get all the stones out of the place. You got to make sure it's the right pH. Then you got to plant and you got to take care of it. That's what they do and they have all the time in the world within specific timelines, mind you. If you look at the history of communism, they had five year plans for certain things, ten for other. Some, some of them were 50 year plans. Look at the United Nations. Isn't that a coincidence they have the same agenda with 5, 10, 15, 20, 50, 100 year plans? And then you look at the Council on Foreign Relations worldwide, working busily away, running all the media, interacting with all the movie makers as well, running all the think tanks, the, the main, the main uh, advisors to governments in the whole planet. Here they are working away like beavers and... Uh, and, and you think things are just developing by themselves. They have their agenda. They've stated it openly, as I say, in Carl Quigley's book, and he was the official historian for them, the Anglo-American establishment. He talked about the banking system, too, in great depth. He actually blames uh, the, the people who became the middle class for causing the problems or the expense of health care, etc., in America. Partly true, partly true. But the other part is, is at one time you see that the old doctors, the beginning and turn of the century, uh, were moneyed men. Moneyed men went into that, so they didn't really need the money. And then, of course, when uh, certain people got into it, it became a gold mine for them, and they got greedier and greedier and greedier. And that's why you have such incredibly expensive health care, for instance, today. But he points that out in his own book. And he blames the middle classes. He's more for the, 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 the older type um, landed uh, moneyed guys, the landed gentry running the whole show. Again, old families, uh, big money, the best of schooling, of course, and what they call tradition. Tradition is family tradition and their own particular class tra- tradition. And by the way, uh, there's no difference in the so-called communist side. You'll see the same congressmen and women uh, getting the tips to invest in the same corporations by the same people, and they all do. I mean, what, what bunch of multimillionaires do you want to vote for, the left wing or the right wing? That's the truth, folks. It's all a show. It's all an absolute show. And that's what we've been kept in, in for such a long time, because in the 1800s, Britain realized that it didn't give a, uh, the vote to more people because it wasn't until World War I they even gave the, the vote to most men. You always hear about the suffragette movement. Most men did not have the vote because they didn't own their house or their apartment or whatever. And that's why they gave it to them at that time. They're running short out bodies to fill uniforms and, and throw out there fighting their wars. And, and so they gave them the vote. But it doesn't make any difference when It's all rigged, as quickly said. He said, because every president and prime minister from the late 1800s has been a member of the same organization, selected by the same organization. But they knew that if they didn't put a show on of democracy, you see, you'd have a revolution every five years or so. So they gave you the vote instead. I'm not dreaming this stuff up. This is from their own books. And we think we're living our lives. There's nothing anyone's doing today that's an original thought of their own. Nothing. Even their hobbies. How they spend their time. How they party. Why they're going out partying or anything else. It's all given to them. And the United Nations said years ago, it's still on their books today, as it was with the globalists, the biggest threat, the biggest threat was not mobs to their agenda. It was not mobs or massive groups of people. It was individuals, individuals who could promote the truth to the people in a coherent manner with no spin on it, nothing to gain personally. That was the biggest threat. Individualism, regaining your individual rights and freedoms, that was the biggest threat to them. That's also why, by the way, You'll find the so-called liberals, which go after all the communist uh, ideas, 
And that's what they call them in Russia. The, uh, Khrushchev said in his visit to America, he said, we don't, we don't call it communist party. He says, we, he says, we call them Ameri- the American branch. He says, we call them liberals. But that's why they don't like the anarchists because the anarchism, initial anarchism, the original anarchism promoted individualism. Not the later collectivist type. And an individual can stand up and say what he thinks and, 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 and uh, believes in. And you should have the right to do so. You should have the right to do so. And not have to belong to this group or that group. Or any other group for that matter. There was so, such a, a, a fear that they had. In America, mind you, still had the tradition of individualism. It was the only country who, that tried this. Understand that, that Europe, for instance, had come out of a feudal system. Straight into an industrial system which wasn't much different. Now the, the industrial overlords with the feudal masters. And through various schemes, again, conspiracies, if you must call it that, but it's in the history books, people like Lord Rothschild put forward the bill in Parliament to get all the little plot farmers off their lands by dumping foreign grain on them. They called it the Grain Act. And that's what they did. Because they wanted to staff these big cities, these red brick cities, uh, with uh, that became slums very quickly uh, with all the peasants to man all their factories. Very successful too. They did it all across Europe. And um, you didn't get books or ideas or even a constitution where individualism was promoted. America was the only, only country that had the, 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 the experiment. That's why they called it the Great Experiment, by the way. The second great experiment in the history books, and it's the official term used in universities, was, was the Soviet system, communism. But America was the first country to actually get the chance of individualism. And even the founding fathers were not really uh, into uh, just handing over the power to the individual because they said themselves that they're not ready to handle it. They, they said the same thing. But they would give them as much freedom as possible and see how it went. And they also said, too, that their constitution would only work with an agricultural society. Once industrialists came in with the bankers to go together, then the war would start for dominance. And it did. And once religion, as I say, religion was knocked out and taken over, by the way, because the Christianity of today is nothing like it was a hundred years ago or even before. They were far better educated in what Christianity was then. They didn't, uh, they didn't praise one country or, or two countries as it is today. And so once the culture was destroyed and the industrials took over, naturally what the, the war of, of, of the Civil War was about, the Civil War was about the industrials of the North and the bankers taking over all the wealth of the South. That was the Middle Eastern campaign of that time, you might say, for plunder and dominance. And we're still on the go today. Can you handle individualism? Can you be responsible for yourself? That's the big question. Of course, the big parties today always keep the welfare state going because they don't want you to be responsible for yourself. They want you to be dependent upon government because they said when we destroyed the family unit, then the state with social workers and hospitals and abortions clinics and so on will take over all the functions that the family used to provide like welfare, food, shelter, clothing, all of that stuff. Awfully successful it's been, hasn't it? So when you talk about getting a country back, where do you want to bring it back to? And not only that, when the communists said that we were contaminated, like Yuri Bezmenov said in the 1960s and the 70s, or the 70s, I should say, ex-KGB man, very well educated, he said he was astonished, he says, when he came to America and found, found it but beyond their wildest dreams how the agenda had been so successful beyond their dreams on what they called the contamination of the West. He was talking about all the cultural decline and immorality that would be promoted as being free and liberal. I don't think that's the kind of freedom the Founding Fathers were talking about. And contamination is a very, very good term to use because everyone has been contaminated. Going to Skinner, Skinner, again, they used all the behavioral psychologists, and he was well paid 
along with others, to do his nasty experiments on babies all the way up. He even put his daughter in, in the Skinner cage for a while. And he said if you want to change the public, you change something in their environment. That's how we, we get altered. First it was the radio. The radio had an enormous effect, brought out in World War I in Britain by the BBC as a propaganda tool for the war. Then TV came in and followed up. Fantastic. Everybody stopped talking to each other. When I was small, I, I was rather unusual, and, and I used to study people watching television. And whereas before, people used to chat, everybody talked, neighbors would pop in all the time, or we'd pop into their places all the time. That, that's what culture was about. That's what real community, not this artificial expert-driven community they're bringing in today, they call it communitarianism. And But when the television came in, I'd watch my parents, I'd watch my, 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 my sisters, I'd watch them laughing at this glass tube, all together, staring at it, hypnotized, and then sad, glum faces when some good person was killed in some, some movie or whatever. It's all American stuff we got, old stuff. And um, it altered the behavior of people. But I also noticed, too, that we now call political correctness creeping in, how they were altering morality and the way that you looked upon things or frowned upon other things. And you would find if you got any discussion, discussions with them after they watched these things, they'd stand up for the, on, on the side uh, that was being supposedly persecuted, perhaps. All, all through fiction, you understand. And yet, as I say, in tribal situations, the taboos are there for a very, very, very good reason. It's easy to destroy a tribe, or a people, or a nation. And they were at work with it right away. What a fantastic tool. Tremendous tool. Images that stay in the mind, imprinted. And that's what they call it, imprinting. And then, of course, along comes the internet, and I stayed off it as long as I could until I said, it's time to start talking about what I know. I've been, I've been reading about this stuff my whole life and, and watching the world movements, knowing where it's going. And I read all the top leaders right through the last hundred odd years and before, uh, from the big think tanks of their day. All the boring stuff, just to get occasional paragraph of something that really mattered. And that's how they write their stuff. They, they scatter knowledge like that, you see. And when you put it all together, I says, it's time I better come out and say something. I better come out and say something now. And I did. And that's what you should be doing too. But don't waste your time in an ego battle trying to convert someone, like it's a religion, into understanding the truth. They have decided not to know. They, they are socialized. That is true socialism. They want to believe that better minds than their own are taking care of them. And that's why their liberties are taken away step by step. Step by step by step. And it doesn't matter what's portrayed to them to the bitter end. Even if you have a Stasi-style system where uh, the SWAT teams are coming in and grabbing your neighbors, which they're actually doing across the country, you'll think it's all normal. Or oh, they must have done something wrong. That's what they, how, how the Soviet people rationalized it. They must have done something wrong until they come for you. And who's going to stand up for you? You have no family. Or if you do, it's all broken and dysfunctional. You have to reclaim your individuality and learn to be responsible for yourself. And don't go the way that others are going, culturally or otherwise. You don't have to party all the time or or or... or Chalk up the notches on your belt at the weekends because it's all destructive and the signs are all around you. All around you. You have gangs everywhere because young men have grown up with no father figures at all. If it's a father figure, he's, he's, he's nagged by a woman. He won't stand up for himself. He's been conditioned not to. He never got affirmative action at school. He was told that he was the cause of all the world's problems right back to the Stone Age. And he's the end product of it. A cultural war. As I say, most wars are cultural and fairly bloodless. 
And they're the most effective wars of all. They're all psychological. And we're living in this particular period today where folk don't even know what it is to really, really even be American. At one time, the rest of the world looked up to America because within it there were always enough good people to fight those at the top and stand up and demand rights and so on and demand that the crooks get, get out. Now they're, they're, they're openly crooks. Uh, they get a slap on the wrist and they're back in again after embezzling millions of bucks. It's totally corrupt. There's nothing there to save. There's nothing there to save, you understand. And you, you cannot fix the Tower of Babel when it's held together with Band-Aid and super glue in a thousand different spots. People don't realize what reclaiming your country would actually mean. It would mean that you would have to change. It's not a terrible thing to say. Back with more after this break. Hi folks, I'm back, uh, standing in for John Stadmer. I'm, I'm Alan Watts. I'll be back on again at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. But just talking about the, what you have to do if you really want to regain yourself. Isn't it terrible to have your mind stolen at birth, eh? Isn't that the biggest crime of all, when your mind is literally stolen at birth? What you could have done with it otherwise, who could, you could have been? Instead of this conditioned, Pavlovian conditioned creature that sits and taps away on keyboards or watches pornography or whatever else you do to pass the time. Everything's meant to further contaminate you and degrade you to help the big system take you down. And we don't like hearing the truth, do we? We don't like hearing that truth about ourselves. And that's why, again, people will attack you uh, when you show them the evidence and you upset them because they, these are perfectly conditioned people who like they're pretty comfortable at the moment in their lifestyle. They can still drink and watch sports and do whatever else they do. The women can watch soaps and fantasize or act out and whatever it happens to be. That's what they think of that freedom is. And they don't have social responsibility to each other or those around them. And yet that's how nations were founded. By sacrifice. And... When you go into the Council on Foreign Relations website, and you should make use of it, because after all, these guys write for themselves. They write for every leader in the world. They have so many departments. It's a, it's a world organization now. And they have so many departments and think tanks working on every minute detail and, and sector of this whole global system. One of the recent articles was about how they must keep repeating and repeating the fact to Americans that they are now global because they're just going to have to accept it. And what they mean by that is you don't have the sovereignty that you used to have. You now have obligations through treaties that have been signed by every traitor for many, many, many a year. As I say, every prime minister for a hundred years and every president has been a member of this same organization, even when it had different names. It was the same organization in the, in the late 1800s. Truman used to start and end every speech by pulling up Shelley's poem on the Parliament of the World. And tears would come in his eyes. It's the Parliament of the World. It's not a nice, happy meeting place for all of us with, with good, decent people representing us. This Parliament of the World, or the United Nations system, that bring, they've got in, that we're all bound by treaties. Um, it's not a nice organization. It's for the elites only. It's you, they believe in eugenics and superior types. They believe in depopulation. They believe in do it. They know they're not going to get volunteers, so they just poison you. Bertrand Russell, who worked for them, said the same thing. We shall use the needle, food, water, etc., in his own writings. Don't you get a bit upset knowing that's been done to you? Don't you just get a little bit upset? Or are you so socialized you want to sit back again and have another beer and watch that sports game? And be happy. Just put out your mind. Because so much has happened over the last well, quite a few years now. As I say, people in the 50s and 60s wouldn't have stood for it, what's happened. What's happened to us? Regain your independence by doing it one at a time and regain yourself. Uh, from Alan Watts, signing in for John Stadmiller, it's good night and tune in to CuttingThroughTheMatrix.com at 8 p.m. Central, uh, Eastern, sorry. Thank you. <laughs>